Tonight's program is Yamasaki in Detroit, uh, uh, Search for Serenity, although best known for uh, his work on the New York uh, Original Trade Center, uh, Manuru, 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 yep. uh, Yamasaki, 1912 to 1986, worked to create distinctive buildings around the world. Uh, his adopted home of Detroit, where he lived and worked for the last half of his life, uh, he all, uh, was a place where he produced many important designs that range from public buildings to offices and private residences. In Yamasaki in Detroit, Serenity, a search for Serenity, uh, John Gallagher, our speaker tonight, presents a bi autobiography, or biography, I'm sorry, and an examination of Yamasaki's work practices with an emphasis on the architect's search for style that would express his artistic goals. Uh, John is a veteran uh, journalist and author uh, whose 2010 book, Reimagining Detroit, Opportunities for Redefining an American City, was named by the Huffington Post as among the best social and political uh, books of that year. His most recent uh, book is Revolutionary Detroit Strategies for Urban uh, Reinvention, and now this book actually. Uh, and the newest book is this book. He was uh, born in New York City and joined the Free Press in 1987 to cover urban and economic redevelopment efforts in Detroit, Michigan, a post that he still holds. I also found out last week that you are the current uh, president of the, uh, the uh, newspaper guild, right? Newspaper guild of Detroit. Of Detroit and is working on the negotiations with the paper. Um, his other books include Great Architecture of Michigan, uh, and he was a Bicknell speaker, speaker talking about that book on April the 21st of 2010, uh, and he was co-author of um, the AI, AIA, or American Institute of Architects, Guide to Detroit, um, the, um, uh, and he and his wife, uh, Sue Jane, uh, live on Detroit's East River. Right. John Gallagher, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Um, so my day job is to work for the Detroit Free Press. I cover urban redevelopment in the city. Sorry, this thing's going to block a couple of you here. I'll try to stand in the middle or somewhere first. Uh, and uh, one thing that I was covering a couple of years ago was the restoration of these pools that here at McGregor, this is the McGregor Conference Center at Wayne State. And after Yamasaki designed this in the, in the 1950s, uh, he created these very beautiful uh, sort of water feature pools here. Uh, and there were some problems over the years with drainage and, and upkeep and maintenance. And so Wayne State drained those pools and they were empty, just basically concrete you know, holes in the ground, very, very unsightly, for a long, long time, for many, many years. And uh, beginning about five years ago, Wayne State started to uh, think about restoring these. And you know, it cost them a couple million bucks, so it was an expensive job, but they, they did exactly the right thing. And uh, you know they spent the money, they did it right, and they restored these to the original vision, which we see here in this photograph by uh, Balthazar Korab, who was a famous um, architectural photographer. Um, and this is the cover of my book. So I wrote about this project, this restoration for the Free Press. And when it was over, um, my previous book had been, uh, uh, Revolution Detroit had been published. I was looking for another one. I liked Yamasaki's work very much. I had never met him. He died in 1986. I arrived in town in 1987, so I just missed him. But I, I met all of his partners, and I knew his work very well, and, and I liked it very much. And so uh, sort of the natural suggestion was, well, let's do a book on Yamasaki. Um, there had not been a biography of Yamasaki up to that point. Um, and uh, you know, 40 years after his death, memories are beginning to fade. And so I thought this was a really good time to, to, to do this. So, Using this project, this restoration, as a springboard, so that's why uh, that's why I did it. Uh, I was fortunate that his personal papers are collected at the Ruther Library at Wayne State. Uh, a lot of his firm's papers, uh, the archives from his from his architectural firm, are in Lansing at the uh, uh, State Archives. But his personal papers, his correspondence, a lot of diaries, a lot of things that he kept. Uh, are uh, right at Ruther, and since I work 10 minutes from Ruther, live about 10 minutes from Ruther, that made it a lot easier for me to run over and, uh, you know, for an hour in the morning and an hour at lunch to sort of go through it all as a box at a time. Uh, it's funny, some books that you write, like uh, Reimagining Detroit or so, one of my Detroit books, start out very vaguely, like I know I'm going to write about the city and I'll write about the future of the city. But it's only when I'm deep into it that it begins to evolve into what it becomes. In this case, I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and it was a matter of sort of getting it, you know, getting it done. So anyway, um, uh, did, has anyone, did anyone ever meet Yamasaki, by the way? You did? Okay. Can you tell me about 
Uh, I just, when I was in college, I was writing a book on architecture, and I just happened to go down there, and I didn't meet him. And, uh, and just, did you talk to him? And I just talked to him, but, you know, I don't really remember other than he gave me a lot of information. Okay, and one more, yep. Yeah. Well, it was just a brief meeting at, uh, he had given a lecture down at uh, downtown, my office was downtown, and he spoke to the, uh, uh, the business uh, organization of the Central Business District and uh, talked to him briefly. But okay. Didn't really get into Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, obviously, even though he's been gone 40 years, that still means a lot of people uh, know him, and I've always enjoyed hearing these stories. Uh, I met a man the other day. Uh, who actually had been sort of an intern or a draftsman in his office and, uh, and told me some of the best stories I heard. And this is, after you finish the book and it comes out, this is always how it works, you know. <laughs> they hear the best stuff afterwards. So, uh, and also one of his partners, a man named Henry Cathard, who uh, was an intern in Smith Hinchman when Yama worked there in 1945. Uh, and Yama took him with him when he started his own firm and he worked for him for his whole career. Um, and was a major source on the book. Uh, there were a couple of stories that he held back. He says, oh, I can't tell you those. You know, you, have to, you know, they're too whatever, too delicate or whatever. So now that the book's out, I'm hoping that he'll actually tell me those uh, stories. I don't know what I'll do with them. But, uh, so anyway, here we are, Minori Yamasaki. Uh, uh, born in 1912, uh, died in 1986, Japanese-American architect. Uh, born to parents who were um, Japanese immigrants, um, the, his parents moved from Japan to Seattle, uh, met there and married there, and he was Minoru as a toddler. He was the oldest son of his uh, immigrant parents, and like uh, many immigrants, um, you know, of any nationality, they put a tremendous, at first they worked very hard in America to be successful, and they put enormous uh, hopes on their oldest son to be the, you know, the hope of the family. And from his earliest years, uh, Yamasaki, or Yama, as he was known to one and all, um, uh, felt this pressure. And, and uh, people who knew him for most of his life tell me that they think that uh, his perfectionism and his drive to succeed stemmed in, in large measure from, the, from this sense of, you know, this enormous sense of responsibility he felt uh, to succeed um, on behalf of his parents, on behalf of, uh, you know, himself, and so on. Um, in, uh, and the family is relatively poor, very working class at best. Um, his father always has a couple of jobs going. Uh, Yama goes to the University of Washington in Seattle. He, uh, uh, as a teenager, he's a typical teenager. He likes baseball and girls and cars and so on, um, and without much direction beyond that. Um, but at one point when he's 16, his uncle comes for a visit, and his uncle has just graduated from architecture school in California. And his uncle has some plans that he's worked on, and Yama rolls them. And Yama writes later that immediately he saw his whole future right in front of him, looking at these architectural plans. He said from that moment, that's all he ever wanted to do in his life, is being an architect. Um, he says the family doesn't have a lot of money. Uh, this is the Great Depression when he's in college in the 1930s. Uh, so he has to work during the summers, and he gets a job at one of these uh, uh, fish canneries up in Alaska. And he works summers in this uh, Alaskan fish cannery. And um, it is absolutely a terrible, terrible job. I mean, 18 hour days, brutal conditions, uh, almost no pay. Uh, the only ones who, who, who uh, work there, have to work there, are Japanese and Filipino immigrants, you know, who are, you know, badly mistreated. And this really um, strikes Yama as entirely the opposite way of how he wants to live. And he comes away from this experience, uh, which he writes about at great length in his life, that this, is, this taught him that he needs a certain amount of uh, dignity, just basic human dignity, uh, you know, decent food, a place to sleep, clean sheets, uh, bosses who are humane and not, not mistreating the workers. Uh, I mean, as I say in the book, most of us have summer jobs that we forget as soon as, we, as, soon as the summer's over. Yama never forgot this, the, how, how terrible this, uh, this, this uh, situation was. Anyway, he graduates from college. He goes to New York City in the mid-1930s uh, to try to make his way as an architect. Uh, he starts to get uh, jobs sporadically, part-time jobs. Um, again, it's the Great Depression, so there's not a lot of work. But um, he works for a firm that did the Empire State Building, which is right here, um, and teaches him a lot. He learns a lot. And uh, he usually works for a while on a specific project and then gets laid off when the work is ended. Uh, because there's, you know, there's very little work at that time in the Depression. 
Um, but everywhere he goes, everywhere he works, he gets these glowing recommendations, uh, letters of recommendation. And a lot of these are in the Ruther Library in his, in his personal papers. And people say things like, this is the most talented young man we've ever had work for us. And he understands the engineering side as well as the artistic side of architecture. And so from the very beginning, he's making this big, this big hit. He also um, wants to improve his drawing skills. So he goes to uh, uh, NYU and Columbia University at night and studies drawing and watercolors. This is one of his watercolors. And he does so well that they hire him to teach. Uh, you know, to teach watercoloring at the school. And again, he does so well that he gets these recommendation letters saying, you know, please come back next semester. We love having you teach. We'd like you to come back. So again, from the very beginning, um, you know, he's standing out even as a young man. Uh, World War II comes along um, as a Japanese American. Uh, he's not exactly the flavor of the month, obviously. Um, he, uh, he's living in New York, so he's not in danger of being interned in California like a lot of the West Coast Japanese Americans were. Um, but in fact, he is so talented that he's given the job of designing this naval base in upstate New York. This is a naval training base up in the Finger Lakes of upstate New York. Uh, he's got to be checked out by the FBI and the Defense Department and everything first. But at the same time that um, Japanese Americans are being you know, stuffed into internment camps in California for the duration of the war, he's given this very sensitive job of designing this naval base in upstate New York. And he writes later, that this was the best training he ever had for running his own firm one day, that he was in complete charge of this project. He would do the working drawings, that he would work with the, his draftsmen to help trans the, translate that into you know, blueprints, and then he would work with the contractors to actually build the buildings and make sure everything got done right. So this is really important. It takes two years to do. He goes back to New York. Uh, he, he's involved politically trying to relocate um, Japanese Americans out of places like California into some place like New York where he lived with his brother and he brought his parents from uh, Seattle to live, live with them. And uh, he's married by this time, so it's a pretty crowded apartment in New York. So here he's giving a speech to the Japanese American Toronto Relocation Society in New York. Uh, it's probably about 1944 or so. Uh, and he designs housing in New York City. Uh, this is in the last stages of World War II when he's back in New York. He's, 30, whatever, 33, 34 by this point. Uh, and this is one of his sketches. This is charcoal on paper. Uh, and uh, this is actually a uh, renovation of an older apartment building that he's been asked to kind of redo. And so a couple of things. First, he is a really good freehand sketch artist, like a lot of architects. A lot of famous architects are really great at freehand sketching. Uh, and also, he is a modernist. Uh, and we'll talk a lot more about this, but he is he's completely into the modern architecture that was emerging at that time. Well, in the war, um, the Detroit firm of Smith Infinite and Grill is the oldest, largest firm in Detroit, um, which had done a lot of the famous downtown Detroit buildings in the 1920s, the Guardian, the Penobscot, and so on, uh, had uh, almost collapsed during the Depression, then came back and did a lot of uh, wartime work um, you know, warehouses and you know military work, and after the war was trying to um, get back that sort of design reputation that it had in the 1920s, and there was this young guy in New York that everyone was starting to talk about, Mary Yamasaki, and so they hired him to be um, their, his chief designer. So he moves to New York, and uh, uh, moves from New York to Detroit to work for Smith Henchman. Uh, thinking he'll be here for a couple of years and he's here the rest of his life, from well, the 1940s through the 1980s. Uh, one of his first buildings is this Bell Telephone Exchange in Birmingham. Uh, this originally was two stories that cut off uh, about here and then was later on added on to. Um, but a couple of things, again, uh, very sleek, modernist, uh, you know, sort of German Bauhaus sort of architecture, uh, right across the street from the uh, Birmingham City Hall which if you know is a very sort of traditional Tudor style uh, building. So this actually was not very popular when he did this. Uh, there were actually protests uh, about this building, uh, sort of ruining downtown Birmingham. You know? um, but notice also that he has this little uh, recessed area, little walkway where you could uh, you know, get some chairs or something with this screen of uh, little landscaping. And this became a signature for him, these plazas, you know, uh, landscaped areas 
uh, and we'll see a lot more of that. So from the very beginning, he's thinking about how to give people a little oasis of respite, even in the middle of the, of the downtown. His first really big important building is this Federal Reserve Annex or Tower in downtown Detroit right here. Now this building is the 1920s Federal Reserve Bank building. This is where they keep cash that goes in and out of local banks. And in the mid-1940s, they needed this, um, they need, needed to expand, and Smith Hinchman got the job. And Yamasaki designed this, which is the first modern building in downtown Detroit. Glass and steel, marble. And Do you understand where your office is? Yes, we are right in this by office. It is right about here. Although this office now goes all the way through. It's all one seamless thing. But I'm right in, right in here. Um, this little area here, which is a little hard to see in the photo, but he has set the entrance back 30 feet from the sidewalk to create this little plaza with some planters and benches. And it is just a delightful little place to get out of the hustle and bustle of the big city. <clears throat> Even though it looks very modest, it is amazing how tranquil and serene this little spot is. Then Yama has begun to develop his, his mantra of serenity, surprise, and delight. That's what he wanted to give people in this building, serenity, surprise, and delight. And he talked about that his whole life. Uh, so again, very successful. Uh, the building really set the pace for modern architecture in, uh, in Detroit. Every, every new building after this is done in the modernist style. Um, he designs um, this complex in Lansing, a government complex, which was never actually built. It was, uh, it was awarded and it was published and got a lot of, got a lot of praise, but uh, it's never actually built. Uh, here he is here with the staff from Smith uh working on this. And this is uh, the same project uh, with Yama and one of his partners, Joe Lineweber, uh, who he later left Smith Hinchman and started on his own. Before. Now he spent he spends five years with uh, Smith Hinchman Mills, which even though he's chief designer, he's not particularly happy with Smith Hinchman. Um, it's a very hierarchical firm. Uh, he complains he never gets to meet with the client. The principals meet with the client, and the assignment comes down, and he works on it. But he never gets a chance to meet with the, the principals of the, of the client. Uh, he's young. He's ambitious. He's in a hurry. So in 1949, 50, he, Lyon Weber, and another man named George Helmuth leave and start their own firm. Uh, so at this point, he is, um, uh, you know, in his, uh, let's see. Um, Oh, about uh, 30, 36, 37 or so. Uh, it's a young firm. They do a lot of small projects around Detroit. This is a dental uh, office in northwest Detroit. Um, the Baron House in um, Palmer Woods. Uh, so the wealthy couple's house where they have a lot of artwork. Uh, notice again, sort of little external courtyards and things. And again, notice the very simplistic sort of modernist uh, design that he's working in. Uh, University of Lincoln School, uh, the expansion of University of Lincoln. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. Uh, the original school, of course, was this sort of the 1920s colonial style building, right? And in, uh, uh, they asked Yama to do, do the expansion, and uh, this is what it gives them. Again, very <coughs> sleek, modernist, pared down, single story, flat roofed, uh, with these unusual features like, like the openings, the oculus openings, these very thin columns, and so on. Uh, and the covered walkways and so on. And so again, uh, I don't know if anybody was here uh, at the time this was done and if they remember if this was very controversial or not. My sense is that it, that it must have been to some extent, but you, some of Peggy is not yes. ahead. C considering the original building, people yeah. were horrified in it. Yeah. Along with Christ Church, who had the Gothic cathedral-like building, and there was a Yamasaki uh, preschool or Nursery school right. built next over. Right, right. So anyway, yeah. So some of this was quite controversial uh, at the time. And mm -hmm. uh, this is the American Concrete Institute building in Detroit, up on Seven Mile. A um, couple of things that are very typical of Yama. Notice he puts the building on a little pedestal here, so that you walk up to the to the main floor. Uh, also, the repeated geometric patterns, which he liked. He liked especially the the Gothic arch, the diamond shape, or you know, pointed arch which is structurally very strong. He also liked it for the aesthetic look of it. And on the end here, he has, um, uh, this is just piping that he's cut off to form a little screen. Uh, so this is very typical of Yama's work, and also it, it, a lot of his buildings photographed really well. Um, but he gets two really big commissions as a young, uh, as a young firm. 
Um, this is Lambert Field in St. Louis, the airport in St. Louis. One of his partners, uh, George Helmuth, is uh, living in St. Louis. He, the firm has an office here and an office in St. Louis. And Helmuth has uh, his father uh, had political connections in St. Louis. And so Yamasaki got the job of um, designing the new airport here. So here, this is one of these first modern airports that came out in the 50s, like Dulles Airport in Washington and TWA Terminal in, uh, in New York. So he's got these very delicate sort of eggshell forms that come down just to these little points. So this whole thing comes down here, photographs beautifully. It's done in modular form. So you have one here, and then you have one here, and one down there, and you can kind of keep going. And this was, this was a really big hit. Uh, again, photographed really beautifully inside and out, and really helped make uh, Yama's name. Uh, less successful was the famous or infamous Pruitt Igo uh, uh, housing project in St. Louis, which you may have heard of. Um, this was one of the first uh, public housing um, projects in American cities, uh, where the city was going to, uh, uh, you know, sort of clear out the, uh, the slum projects and move everybody into new housing, move poor people into new housing. Um, and it was really controversial, and even Yama thought uh, he, uh, he advised the St. Louis authorities that these should be low-rise buildings. He wrote at the time, he said, man is a ground animal, he needs to live near the grass and the trees to feel human. Again, going back to his experience in Alaska, you know, that, the connection with nature that was so important just to feel human. And the St. Louis authorities said, no, we got to pack more people into these sites, it's got to be much denser. And you know, as often happens, the client wins, and so the buildings got bigger and more numerous and taller, and, and they packed more people into them. Uh, they were never maintained properly. Uh, they were uh, terribly um, unpopular with the people who lived in them. And 20 years later, the whole place was imploded. <coughs> so Yama later called this the biggest mistake of his life. He said, "You can't, you can't solve big social problems with with pretty buildings." Um, but at any rate, uh, all this time he's, he's raising a family. His wife, Terry, is a concert great pianist. Uh, she went to Juilliard School in New York. They met one in New York when she was at Juilliard and he was a young architect. Got married two days before Pearl Harbor, uh, which created problems for him later with his draft board. Uh, they thought he had done some kind of sham marriage to get out of, get out of, get out of the draft. That's before he went to the, to the naval base. They had three children. Uh, when he moves here, he, he wants to buy a home in some place like Birmingham or Bluefield Hills, and the realtors won't sell to him because he's Japanese American, uh, which was something that he faced a lot in his life. During the war, uh, people would come up to him and accuse him of being a spy or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, uh, stuff like that, and he'd be accosted on the subway and all that. So since he can't buy a home where he wants, he buys an old farmhouse out in the Troy area, and uh, they live there for... Uh, Seven, uh, 25 years. He raises his he and Terry raised their family there. He eventually gets to sell it for some enor enormous profit when Troy is, you know, <laughs> you know, building up. So he has the last laugh, but um, that was an issue. So at this point, uh, he started his firm. He's making some progress. Uh, he's about at the age of 40, which is about when most architects really begin to come in to their own. And he's still searching for a uh, a style to express what he thinks. Uh, he wants to express. Now, when he was in school, in college, he studied the Beaux-Arts. Uh, this is in you know, the late 1920s, early 30s. Uh, this was the style that was sort of being taught in school at that time. This is the Palais de Beaux-Arts in France. Um, this extremely you know, effusive uh, historical styles with uh, uh, all, you know, all the, all the you know, uh, gargoyles and all the decoration and everything. And, you know, obviously this is really beautiful stuff, but at the time, uh, Yama and the other uh, young would-be modernists did like this style. They thought it was something dishonest about this because it's all decoration applied to the outside of the building without having much to do with, you know, the building itself. What he much preferred was the, the emerging modernism school as at the Bauhaus in Germany. Uh, simple glass, steel, enamel, very simple, pared down designs, no, no decoration. This is what he, what he really liked. His hero was Mies van der Rohe, who was doing this kind of thing. Uh, and uh, there's actually a story that he tells how uh, in the uh, 50s when Mies van der Rohe designed uh, Lafayette Park here in Detroit, a very famous uh, project. 
and comes to Detroit for the dedication, and Yama goes up to him at the dedication and very nervously uh, asks him to come home to dinner that night. And to his great surprise, um, he agrees and says yes. So Yama calls his wife Terry and says, hey, Terry, I'm bringing home the most famous man in the world. Would you come home and start cooking dinner or whatever? Uh, so they do, and uh, he writes later that uh, Mies uh, delivers this monologue that goes on for hours about architecture and drinks martini after martini after martini. <laughs> and it was, but for Yama, it was one of the great nights of his life to just sit at the feet of Mies van der Rohe. Uh, he also writes about this building in New York, the Lieber House, which is the, uh, one of the first of the glass box international style buildings in New York City by a man named Gordon Bunchak from Skid Row Romans Merrill. And uh, Yama likes this. He thinks it's a beautiful building, but he also struggles with it because he says, this is not the end of modernism. Uh, he said, this is too simple. He says, if this is all we have, this is going to be terrible. We don't want to see this you know, block after block after block of glass box buildings. And he's fairly struggling. He says, this is, this is a way station in the evolution of modernism, whereas a lot of the international style people like Von Shaft and Mies van der Rohe pretty much said, this is it. You know, we found the answer. And this is you know, a really controversial moment in, in architecture. Uh, so the turning point for Yama comes in 1954 when uh, he's been in the hospital. He, he actually had a tough uh, uh, time in his life medically. He had a lot of uh, cases of bleeding ulcers and other things, which you know, we can speculate whether it's due to the, the you know, pressure he put on himself and perfectionism. But uh, for a while, he thought he may, not, he may not even live. But he survives, he recovers. He goes to, um, and he's got a job in Japan, so he decides to take some extra time and uh, travel the world and see all the great architecture uh, around the world uh, through, you know, during this time. So he goes to Japan, and he visits these Japanese tea houses and Japanese gardens, and he is, uh, uh, for the first time, uh, reminds himself that, yes, I am Japanese. Um, like a lot of sons of immigrants, he, he's denied that his whole life. He said, I'm not Japanese, I'm American. But when he gets here in Japan, in, you know, about the age of 40 or so, uh, he understands that this is part of his heritage, and he completely responds <clears throat> to what he finds in the tea houses and in, in the Japanese gardens, the serenity, the beauty. Uh, <clears throat> he writes how if you, you know, you're on a bustling street and you walk into a tea house and suddenly everything is tranquil and everything is beautiful and everything is just perfectly precise. <clears throat> and you walk out into the garden and back and it's a very Every leaf and petal is placed there by the hand of God. And so he just completely absorbs this sort of thing. He goes to India, he sees the Taj Mahal, and he not only loves the building itself and how beautiful it is and how serene it looks, but all the gardens and the water features and everything, you know, the, complete, the complete surroundings. Notice, of course, that this building is set on a pedestal, and notice the symmetry of this, of this building, and also the water features of the surrounding landscape. And then he goes to Europe and he sees the great cathedrals of Europe. And again, he's just he's just knocked over by how, how beautiful these things are, uh, the silhouette that they place on the, that they have on the skyline, how the sun and shadow play across the face of the cathedral throughout the day. So he comes home and he wants to put all of this into his architecture. And his first chance to do that is here at the Graver. Uh, and so this is sort of the culmination of everything he's learned, and the first time he re his style really emerges. So, so, you know, the building itself is pretty simple. You have two, two wings, two meeting wings, uh, <coughs> divided by <coughs> a central atrium corridor with a skylight that runs the length of the building. <coughs> Excuse me, just kidding. And, uh, uh, and of course, notice the uh, the water feature, the sculpture garden, all the landscaping and so on. So um, one thing to, to note here, the building only occupies about half the site. Half the site is reserved for all these other, other features. And for them, this is absolutely essential. This was not extras, this was not frills. This is part and parcel of the building. And also, of course, the uh, <clears throat> uh, since you have basically uh, uh, you know, floor to ceiling windows, um, the outside-inside connection with nature is very, very important. Um, here, is, uh, here is the interior. Uh, again, he really believed in natural light, so a lot of his buildings have these skylights that run the length of the building. 
Uh, and this plan of you know two wings divided by a central atrium of the skylight is something he used a lot. And for him, uh, no detail was too small. Even the door, you know, it's very, you know, the door itself, just an artwork in itself. Um, he, uh, he would tell everybody in his office, and I heard this from, from his own people, he would go up to uh, you know, the guy doing the electrical system, and he would say to him, now, you two are the designer of this building, it's not just me, but you two are a designer of this building. What you do with the electrical system is going to be part of this building, the most important part of this building. <laughs> and he would give these pep talks to people, and uh, someone said he'd be the best football coach that ever was. Uh, he was a very small man physically, only about five foot five or so, uh, very slight, uh, soft spoken, uh, you know, always wore a white shirt and tie. Um, but when he walked in the room, his presence was enormous. And I've heard this from many, many people. He just, you know, people began to think of him as, as this guru, as this genius. And I think it, by this point in the mid 50s, uh, his Japanese ancestry which has worked against him up to now because it's been the subject of a lot of prejudice and so on, it begins to work in his favor because America becomes fascinated with all things Japanese and, uh, and he begins to be you know, almost like Yoda in Star Wars and he becomes, he becomes the guru that everyone wants to, wants to talk to. Uh, another building he did, the Reynolds Metal Building in Southfield. Uh, again, this is one of his uh, best buildings and again, the photographs are just amazing. And again, by, by Corey. So we see the building is set up on its pedestal. You've got this lovely water feature. Uh, you've got uh, uh, walkways and so on, and the screen around it. Um, really, really photographs beautifully. Uh, unfortunately, this building is passed through different owners. It's, it's empty now and boarded up, which is a real problem. Uh, and so, um, so hopefully someday, somebody will, will rescue this. Uh, it's interesting that uh, among the greatest architects, you sort of have to buy into their whole program. Uh, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright was like this. You know, he, did, he designed the furniture, the drapes, the artwork, I mean, everything. Well, with Yama, he, he designed so much of the surrounding areas around the building that you really have to get the whole picture or it doesn't work. So if you drive by this building today, uh, and, and, and you know, the, the, the greenery is now a parking lot, the water feature is gone, and so on. It doesn't, it doesn't work nearly as well as we see it here. Uh, where is it? Uh, it's on uh, Southfield up around, uh, I'm trying to think. James Cousins. Yeah, up around about 10 miles. Eight, eight mile on James Cousins. Okay, okay. 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 Um, so anyway, um, and here, pardon me, here's the interior. Again, uh, skylights, lots and lots of natural light. Very clean, modern, uh, very clean, modern office building. And you know, I, I, I am not a critic of uh, traditional historical architecture, Gothic. I love all that stuff too. But when you think of how different this must have been in the 50s when he was doing this for the first time, and people were seeing this kind of thing for the first time, uh, you know, we've seen this a thousand times since, but in lesser hands and lesser architects who just kind of knock off the, you know, kind of cheap suburban office office building. But uh, this must have been just extraordinary. Even if, even if you look at this. This receptionist desk. What, what, what this must have been like to see something like that for the for the first time. Uh, Wayne State hires him. Uh, besides McGregor, he does four other buildings at Wayne State: uh, the Education Building, uh, the Business School, uh, and Duroy Auditorium. And he also does the campus plan for for Wayne State. So he's so he's obviously this major figure in Detroit. He does the gas company headquarters building, the you know, the first one of the first modern skyscrapers. Again, even here at the base, he had a water feature and landscaping and a, a sculpture. Uh, both the water feature and the sculpture have been removed at this point, so hopefully they'll get restored at some point. Uh, but again, really beautiful, simple, simple building. And the first time he uh, began to work out some of these ideas that he later used with the World Trade Center. And uh, here he is. He, he uh, was a fanatic about model building. Uh, one of his partners told me he thought that since you know, this drive for perfectionism, he, he didn't, didn't trust that a two-dimensional drawing on paper would capture, would, would be honest enough, or detailed enough. So he had these elaborate models that were more elaborate than any other firm was doing at this time. Then they would have cameras on dollies that would go around these so you could see them at all times. Different lighting systems so you could see them at different times of the day. He would light them inside and out and all this kind of stuff. And, 
and he would do not just the building itself, but all the buildings around it, so they would get a true sense of what was you know, what this was going to be like. Uh, here's the interior of the uh, one Woodward office tower, the gas company building. Uh, you notice on the ceiling, he has these little blue lights. Um, this was the, the, the gas company, Mishcon, uh, had originally thought that they would fill this up with appliances, because that's what they had in their old headquarters, you know, gas appliances. And well, he, he said, you can't do that. <laughs> but, uh, but he did create these little blue uh, lights that were meant to be uh, uh, reminiscent of uh, uh, pilot lights on stoves, little blue, <laughs> little lights. And he worked very, very hard to get just the right kind of bulb, just the right color, just the right glow that it would, that it would shine through. Uh, so a real, a real perfectionist. And then in Seattle, he designs the, uh, this is the U.S. Uh, Science Pavilion of the Seattle World's Fair in 1962. And he designs the, the buildings, the water feature, and this very, very interesting sort of sculptural element uh, that's its signature element. And uh, this, this becomes very, very significant for Yama because at the same time, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey is planning this really big office project in Lower Manhattan. And they send one of their executives out to the World's Fair to look around and see if you can see anything that might suggest who they should hire. And the guy looks at this and he's just completely blown away by how beautiful this is and how serene this is and how he's created this entire oasis with a few simple strokes. And he had never heard of Yamasaki, but he learned who it was. And the uh, Port Authority uh, sends Yama a letter and says, we want you to design this new project for us. And of course, the project becomes the World Trade Center, Twin Towers in New York City. Um, when they sent him the letter, uh, it says, this is a $280 million project, 2800000. And uh, he comes out, he gets it, he reads it, he comes out in the middle of his office and calls everybody around and says, now this is really terrible. You see they have a typo here, they have an extra zero. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is really bad. I mean, you know, this can hurt your reputation if you're not really careful. Uh, <clears throat> But of course, it was a $280 million project, the equivalent today of about a billion and a half or $2 billion. And when Yamasaki uh, realizes how big this thing is supposed to be, he tells them that he can't do it, that his firm is too small. He's only got about 40 people. He's never done anything like this before. But they really want him. Again, by this time, he's become sort of the one to go to for, for this kind of thing. And so he agrees eventually. And the project takes 10 years of his life. Um, and uh, uh, it's the biggest thing he's ever done, the biggest thing anybody's ever done. It's the tallest buildings in the world when they open. And completely, uh, completely consumes him. Uh, uh, he, uh, he, his model makers uh, produce models that are so tall, they have to uh, take the ceiling out of his, out of his office building. Uh, <clears throat> he he uh, uh, disagrees with the Port Authority people. Again, they, they want the tallest buildings in the world to make a statement. And Yama says, well, they're only going to be the tallest buildings in the world for about a year before somebody else does something taller, which he was right. That's what happened. Um, so he suggested a series of smaller, um, you know, smaller towers around, around the site. Uh, you know, maybe five or so towers around the site. Uh, but the Port Authority insists on, on this. And they also wanted more office space than Yama thought they should, they should pack in these things. 10 million square feet of office space. Um, that's basically the equivalent of about uh, five Renaissance centers in this one project. Um, and so they win. So the buildings get taller and, and thicker, stouter than Yama thinks is wise. But again, the client kind of wins out. Um, and so these buildings then become sort of his, you know, the first line of his obituary, inevitably. And um, they both make his reputation and in some ways ruin it too, because these are extremely unpopular uh, with the critics. The critics hate, hate these. Um, uh, there's a woman from the New York, New York Times, Ada Louise Huxtable, a very famous architecture writer, who absolutely just blisters uh, these buildings in Yamasaki in her review in 1974. Uh, Yam is quite hurt by this. Uh, he, he responds by writing uh, a seven-page letter to Huxtable uh, defending his design goes through several drafts, which are in his, uh, in his papers at Luther. He, uh, uh, he was such a perfectionist, he did everything, I mean, many times to get it right. And he makes three points about these buildings, uh, all of which have to do with the engineering. Uh, first, um, 
that the hole in the ground, the excavation to, to, to do this. Um, the big problem was that it, they're very close to the Hudson River and uh, pressure from the Hudson River will collapse the hole if they're not careful. Uh, so they devised a system where they will dig down one 30-foot section, force down a frame with the reinforced steel, pour in slurry, which is sand and water, and then pump in uh, concrete into that, and, and the concrete is heavier, so as that sinks, the slurry rises up and drains away. And when, it's, when, it, when the concrete sets and cures and dries, you've got one 30-foot section of the wall. And then they went right next to it and did the next one and did that all around the hole until they had this, this terrific you know, concrete basin that they could use as the, as the uh, you know, the, the, the uh, basements and so on, and, and the, uh, the foundations for the World Trade Center. Um, he also um, did a lot with the, uh, uh, with the bracing. Skyscrapers need to be braced against the wind uh, so that they don't sway, you know, sway back and forth. I understand in, in uh, uh, the last day or two, some of the skyscrapers in Chicago had to close their observation decks because they were swaying too high in the wind. So to prevent that, all, all tall buildings have bracing of one kind or another. But that takes up a lot of room, usually on the interior. So now I use this truss system on, oops, sorry, on the outside. Uh, what, what looks like just sort of a pretty lattice work is actually a very elaborate truss system that carries the weight of the building uh, and it makes it more sturdy. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm told uh, that when the uh, planes hit on 9-11, uh, the reason the building stood as long as they did is that the, the weight transferred to the undamaged portions and, and, and held it up, you know, as long as it, for as long as it did. And then finally, in the elevator cores, on a building this tall, the elevators would eat up, you know, half the space in, in the interior. And so he devised a system of uh, local and express elevators <coughs> where you get on at the first floor and go up uh, to one of two areas, either here or here, and then you'd often take a local to your floor. And, and all that saved about um, a million and a half feet of office space that was saved for, for rentable office space. So it made an enormous difference that made these buildings uh, profitable for, for the Port Authority. Um, unfortunately, though, none of these things were sort of really visible to the public. Uh, they were all sort of engineering kind of solutions that were very innovative. Um, and so uh, it, didn't, it didn't change the public's opinion about, about these buildings. And again, these were highly criticized um, as just out of place in, uh, in New York. And uh, uh, it gave rise to the notion that Yama's best work were in his smaller buildings. And I think there's some justification for that. I, you know, I personally found yeah, these <coughs> kind of out of place on the New York City uh, skyline. And not as, uh, not as evocative or as serene as his other buildings. Uh, but even here, he gives a third of the site to a plaza. Uh, to try to uh, get people in these buildings, who are obviously going to be modern office workers, very rushed and very busy, give them some place, some little oasis where they can, <clears throat> you know, relax a little bit. Um, the project makes him world famous. Uh, he, he's on the cover of Time, uh, one of the few architects to ever be on the cover of Time. <clears throat> Gets to the White House, meets President Johnson, has numerous other honors, honorary degrees, and, and, and so on. Uh, and it makes him, uh, he goes to, uh, it makes him uh, famous, so he's got projects all over the world now. He goes to Saudi Arabia, uh, designs airports in Saudi Arabia, uh, which they like so much they put on their currency. This is Yama's design, they put on the Saudi currency. And it makes him a designer of skyscrapers. So oh, in the past, he's done all these sort of uh, university buildings and that kind of stuff. And now he's designing skyscrapers all over the world. Uh, this is in Seattle. Uh, some people call this the golf tee building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's also known as the beaver building because the beaver spends all the way for the uh, uh, building. But again, you know, still looking for very innovative uh, engineering solutions to buildings. Uh, he, so he's doing skyscrapers all over. This is Century City in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, kind of nice. I like that. Uh, and then bank buildings. Um, this one's in uh, Buffalo, and this one's in uh, Minneapolis. Now again, uh, a lot of people would, would say that his, his taller buildings are not as successful as his smaller ones, and I think this is an example of something that's probably perfectly fine, but not, you know, not really uh, um, that uh, serene or or uh, or as evocative. Something like this. This is a, a library at the University of 
University, uh, which I find much more elegant and much more typically young. Um, so, uh, at any rate, he, uh, uh, even working around the world and traveling all the time, he still has time to design a new home for himself and Terry. This is in um, Bloomfield Township. Uh, they live here the last 15 years of his life, and she lives for another, another 10 years or so after that. Uh, very, very beautiful, very serene uh, little home on a beautiful site, beautiful wooded site. Uh, and again, very Miesian. It's interesting that he's known uh, you know, for putting these geometric screens around this building, but when he designed his own home, he did a very Miesian, almost glass box uh, kind of home. And he designs Temple Bethel in uh, Telegraph Road, uh, in Oakland County. Uh, very innovative structurally. Uh, he designs it such that uh, he and his engineers design it such that the entire structure comes down to these, you know, just a handful of columns like this, which allows this this open uh, glass open area, this connection with nature that is so so important to him. He also solves a very interesting problem that uh, religious architecture has, which is uh, you get a certain number of crowds most weeks, but on holy days you get much bigger crowds, so where do you put everybody? So he has the normal seating here in the main center, and then he's got these two side aisles that are slightly elevated, and these are where you put all the chairs, the temporary seating on high holy days. And so instead of having people you know, go to the gymnasium and watch it on some closed circuit television, you can actually fit people in if they move the chairs and it looks like you know, it's up it should. Um, so he's designing uh, up until the end of his life. Uh, he develops cancer. Again, one of the many illnesses he had throughout his life. Uh, he works on his autobiography, you know, Life and Architecture. Uh, goes through multiple drafts of that. Uh, he dies at the age of 72 in uh, 1986. Um, so the legacy of Yamasaki, I think, uh, first is a lot of great buildings that we have, especially in Detroit. We're very fortunate we have a lot of those great buildings. Uh, and, and more broadly, I think the notion that um, a building is not just the building, but it's the entire surroundings, and you should have gardens, landscaping, uh, water features, uh, um, uh, you know, greenway paths. I mean, something that has some connection with nature, uh, something that, as he said, creates a sense of serenity and surprise and delight for the people who are going to use that. That, that idea is so accepted, I think, that there's no important building that doesn't sort of take that into consideration now. And I think that's, that's really his, uh, his important legacy. So with that, I'm happy to uh, hear your comments, questions, thoughts. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, what else was happening in 2009? Yeah. The Great right, yeah, Recession. Yeah. Uh, Good point. The yeah, and I think recession. it was, uh, from what I gather, I think it was somewhat mismanaged uh, by that point. His partners carried on the firm, uh, and one of the sons helped manage the firm for a while after he died. Uh, at some point, it was bought by somebody else from an outsider who had never worked there. And I know there were some accusations of mismanagement mm -hmm. and so on. And then, of course, um, the Great Recession ran it into the ground. So mm -hmm. the firm uh, did not survive. Although, there's yet another successor firm, uh, a young man who worked for Yama for a while, who bought the name out of, out of sort of bankruptcy. Now, he's got a firm called uh, something like ABC Yamasaki. I forget the exact initials. It's in uh, Birmingham. Uh, so in some ways, it continues. But the firm itself is gone. And mm -hmm. His office building that he designed for his firm in Troy has been demolished. Mm -hmm. And so the firm, is, the firm is gone. So what else? Yes? Did any of his sons get into architecture? No, the one son worked at the firm for a while, but he was a manager, he was not an architect. The other son became a photographer, worked at the Free Press for a while, before my time, and uh, won the Pulitzer Prize for his photography, so very talented. And the daughter, I believe, was an educator, uh, but I'm not sure. I've met her briefly, but I don't know too much about her. And how about the flat roofs on, on some of his buildings? Was there, was there ever a leaking problems like that? Well, any flat roof will leak if you don't secure the roof properly. And so, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright had leaky roofs and things like that. That often has to do with the seals and the joints and so on. And, and uh, you know, with Wright, he, he would push technology to such limits um, that, that uh, they weren't always tested. And so sometimes he would get a leaky roof. But with the Amos buildings, I think as long as you know you replace the roof ceiling 
you know, you won't have any problems. In, in my building, right, I live in a 1920s condo building downtown. And we've had to replace the roof once in the last 20 years. I'll probably have to do it again in another 20 years. So that's not really, his, his buildings work very well. Down's buildings work very well. Wright's buildings often have these problems with technology because he pushed the limits so much. But Yama's built, Yama knew a lot about technology, engineering, and all that, all that stuff. Yes, so, what is, did he do any of the buildings in Lafayette Park? Uh, no, those were, uh, Meese, Meese did the basic Lafayette Park, and some other people did the additions to Elmwood Park, and the other okay. pieces. Of, I, to my knowledge, I don't think Yama did any of those. So, it, there's a, it's a little hard to say in some things, because early on, he did so many small buildings. Mm -hmm. Retail shops, homes, dentist office, things like that. Mm -hmm. That uh, we don't have a list of everything that he did. Uh, he did a lot. Once he started doing university buildings, we know those kind of things mm -hmm. and skyscrapers. But he did an awful lot of small stuff over there. So you showed his drawings. Uh, he got a master's in fine arts too, besides architecture. That I that I, I don't know. Okay. He, uh, but he but he used that. that oh yeah. In his drawing building. Obviously. Yes. Yeah. yeah, he did. Yeah, um, what many architects would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to ask if anyone here has a house? Well, does anyone here have a Yamasaki house? Really? Oh. Which one? It's, uh, it's which one? It's in the woods here. Uh, uh, really? Uh, in the here. Tell, tell us about it. Tell us about it. Pardon? Tell me about it, please. Hold it. Right song. Okay. You, you know. I mean, the story goes he, he designed this one home, and then, like 50 years later, he came back into it, and somebody had done something like the curtain rods, and he, he immediately said, That's got to come down. <laughs> so, um, but I think, yeah. Other unique things. All of our light switches are low. Can you open them? Sure. Can you open them? So the very low. And our bathrooms, we had to change one, but it's so small for a uh, Some of that might have been, you know, bathrooms used to be smaller than they are. And if you go to the that's on the Eleanor Courthouse uh, and take that tour, you'll be amazed at how small those bathrooms are in there. So some of that is just the way they did things. But it's peaceful. Their house is serene. Right. It has all those qualities. Yeah. It's peaceful. Yeah. Uh, what else? Anything else? John, thank you so much for being here. You got it. Thank you very much.